Hello, anyway, hi. Yes, CSS code. Uh, so, thing about code nowadays, I think, is that, you know, there's really way too much code involved in building things right away. Uh, and not just CSS, it's CSS and JavaScript. Anyone here, you know, get really overwhelmed about how they write CSS code? Because, you know, the way it is in our organization, so we have back-end designers, uh, back-end developers, we have designers, and we have front-end people. And any time, in any project, it's always like the most commits are always from the front-end guys, you know, doing a lot of CSS. So it is very stressful. So there is a lot of CSS code involved in producing anything today. It's just, you know, the part of life. And to put this into perspective, I took one of the most, uh, you know, one of the forefront pieces of literature in human history. This is uh, The Tragedy of Hamlet. It's produced by some guy named William Shakespeare. I think he's a very famous bard or something. Anyway, so this was produced at a time after 1599, and it was completed sometime before 1602. You know, people aren't really sure because it's been so long. So... We don't know how long Shakespeare took to write this, but it could have been up to three years if you were going to go with those dates, right? And I was really curious, like, just how long is this? So I fired up my terminal and downloaded it. Did you know, like, it's free to download nowadays out of Project Gutenberg? Anyway, so I downloaded a text file, and just to really find out how big is Hamlet, and it turns out it clocks in at something like 34,000 words. Actually, more like 32,000 if you take out the copyright notices and all. But anyway, so that's Shakespeare in three years produced 34,000 words, approximately. And that's the case for, for this guy, for William Shakespeare, right? But I'm really curious, like, let's put that into perspective if, you know, how much code does your average front-end guy do in a, you know, in a span of three years, or even just a project, really? So, so I was really curious on the numbers on this, so here's what I did. So, hmm. So here's what I did with that. Uh, sorry, hold on. Yeah. And, huh. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I tried to do the exact same thing that I did with, you know, with Hamlet, except do it with Git, because, you know, we're in the future now, and we have version control, and version control is awesome, and it lets you do things like, you know, uh, take this, and what it's going to do is, it's going to just take all the, the commits of a given author, in this case, I just pick one of my colleagues, you know, uh, she does front end and CSS for the most part, and filter it by what she does uh, in this folder, the app asset style sheets, and then filter it out by how many lines that, it, that she wrote and count it in the same way using WC. So what happened was, you know, it was really fast, and it turns out it's like 43,000 lines, oh no, 43,000 words, I think that's like in less than a year. So that's sort of like 1.25 Hamlets that one of my colleagues wrote in actually less than a year for just one project. So yeah, I'm not saying you guys are Shakespeare for writing CSS, you know, but uh, let's just put this into better perspective, you know, into more realistic numbers. So I took one of the projects that we have today in the world that would I'd say is written pretty, you know, uh, t t it's taken a while to write. So uh, I wanted to see how much CSS WordPress has. It turns out 
half of WordPress is actually front-end code. 76,000 lines is CSS, but uh, if you notice, it's almost just as much front-end code as much as back-end code, you know? That's, that's a lot of CSS to write. And put this in another perspective, the websites today have really huge CSS. Uh, Pinterest itself has 1.6 MB, and that's in compressed uh, minified form. And what that means is 47, I, I tried to uncompress it just to see and compare. So that's 47K lines of code or 148K words. So that's sort of like 4.3 Hamlets for a Pinterest. Anyway, I keep on calling it Hamlets because uh, Hamlet is in, if you assume three point something words per line, then it's something like 10K lines is like one Hamlet, which is usually the point where things kind of break down in CSS. You know, when you write a project, you, write, you start with maybe a thousand lines of CSS, but it gets to like 5,000 and 10,000, it gets really painful. So anyway, that's kind of like my experience to be the breaking point of it all. So we all know this, that the world needs and writes a lot of front-end code. And we also do a lot of back-end code. In fact, we make just as much front-end code as back-end code. And we have lots of standards on how to do back-end code nowadays, right? I mean, everyone's really opinionated about how do you write JavaScript, for example, like how they use spaces over tabs or their line lengths and all. And people are very obsessed about how to write code properly. So how come people don't really write CSS the way they do programming? Like, why haven't they thought it out so, just as well if we're writing just as much? Uh, it seems like we're not up to this level of standards that we would have and we would expect out of ourselves in backend programming. But in CSS, you know, we don't have those things. But uh, you know what? Tell you what, it's not really true. We actually have a lot of history as a human culture to, to have perfected and, you know, figure out how to actually do CSS. Yeah, it's been a while. CSS has been a long in here for a little long while, and I'm going to run you through it. Anyway, hi, my name is Rico. You might have found me on the internet, GitHub, and all that as rstuckers. It's my username, and I'm here to tell you about the future. Well, the modular future of CSS. Yeah. All right. So, uh, before I tell you about the future and you know, of course, we have to go back and tell you all about the past. So I'm going to run you through what happened in the past, I don't know, 10, 20 years of CSS development and how we got here today and what ideas we've all had to get to where we are. So let's go back to uh, once upon a time. Uh, anyone here around at that time doing web development? Oh yeah, a couple of people. All right, well, I hope this is like a bit nostalgic for you. Anyway, long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, HTML was written a little differently than how it was today. It's actually still the same HTML. I mean, these pages load the same way in the new browsers, but uh, everyone had different tricks on how to make things look just how they wanted it, you know. We used tables and pixel GIFs that were used as spacers. So here's Apple, which I think it was from 2004. That's actually not so. That's actually pretty fairly recent. That's like 12 years ago, and they're using tables to format that nav bar. Nowadays, we probably used. I don't know, LIs and floats and flexbox or whatever fancy new technology. But, today, but back then we had tables to format it just like that. It's kind of a shame. It, everyone was proud of it, but it was actually pretty hard to do. So we had to, re, to do things like this just to get 
a certain text to look the way it is. So there's actually a font tag. Uh, I'm sure a couple of people here actually don't know there is a font tag. And I think that's a really good achievement that we've come far and forgotten about this tag. Anyway, so before CSS, this was how people formatted their text. Fast forward a little more years, 2003, people kind of thought that, you know, we're in this cusp of like modern browsers and, you know, there was a big browser war, won't go into details of that. And eventually they kind of realized and settled, okay, truce, let's settle for web standards and let's standardize how we actually render. And one of the offshoots of that idea was some people thinking, hey, couldn't we use this new CSS thing, which has actually existed for a while, but no one took it much seriously. But can we use it to separate content and style? So if you notice the way we did HTML before was like content and style is intertwined. Like you put the font, the actual font names in this, in the HTML and the actual colors, which today, if, if I did that, I think my coworkers would, you know, hit me in the head, but Back then, that was the norm. So what if there was a way to separate them and this was CSS? So, you know, things started to appear to change this into something a bit more palatable. So kind of separating content where this HTML is just all about whatever the text is and your CSS is all about how to format that text. So that was really good. And back then it was called CSS positioning. And nowadays it's just called CSS. So, but back then it was this new fancy idea, like, wow, no more font tags and no more tables. And how did they get away from tables? So a lot of patterns emerged during this era. So people thought of different ways to do things, no more like excessive images. And there, there were different ways on how to, you know, how to make two blocks of text show up side by side and things like that. You know, that was 2003, that was pretty sweet. So one of the books that were around during that period that really professed this idea was, people call it the Blue Beanie Book nowadays. Uh, it's on its third edition, but the first edition came out around 2003. So Jeffrey Zeldman was not the first person to to have these ideas, but you know, well, this was kind of a milestone, a landmark for for this new CSS positioning idea when this book came out, which was around the time web standards was, you know, being put forward and browsers were trying to, you know, co coordinate with each other finally, and eventually that idea got formalized into, hey. Each thing could be, each concern could be separated, wherein your HTML is just about the content, reusable content. There was even XHTML at that point, anyway. So the styling is just in C CSS and behaviors in JS. So it's just a perfect separation, wherein before it was kind of a blurred, you know, no distinction between one and the other. So, one of the wonderful things that also came out of this idea is since HTML is just about content, what if that content was reusable? What if that HTML is just about putting your content there and describing what the content is? So we call this like a semantic approach. So if you have something like, you know, just your standard component that looks like this, probably break it down into smaller divs and each div would have a class that describes what it is. Like it's not telling you it's green or it's rectangle or, you know, it's this and that height. It's just telling you what it is. Say it's like, you know, heading and then have that defined in the CSS what heading is supposed to look like. And we also tried to use the proper tags at that point. There was this was around a time HTML5 was burgeoning and we were having all these fancy tags like header, footer, and A-side. Anyway, so 
uh, we were moving towards this idea that HTML should be describing the content in a semantic way, and this was called semantic HTML, which all really tied into the CSS positioning movement. Uh, nowadays, we just call it HTML, but back then it was a big thing and call it semantic HTML, but there was this I think one problem with semantic HTML was no one really knew how to write semantic CSS for semantic HTML. And everyone just kind of did their own thing and came kind of a mess. So if you have that same component a while ago, right? So you are going to write CSS for it. And since we have less and SAS and all those preprocessors from you know, from around that time, they, we started using this nested syntax, which was pretty cool. Uh, it, it was very convenient and just kind of used it and used it, you know, until, until at some point just kind of becomes this mess. And suddenly, I don't know about you, but this is very familiar. I've landed into many projects where CSS is indented way too far and it looks like a sideways mountain range if you tilt your head. So, it, it, you know, this was one of the dangers of people not really thinking about how to style their CSS, uh, style their semantic HTML. And this problem is still around today. This isn't like a relic of the past. There's still a bunch of projects that are done this way, heaven forbid. But yeah, we have moved on and learned from our mistakes. Some you know, some people have come up with ideas on how to solve this. So this is really tangled CSS, which, you know, uh, before you know it, you've written way too much CSS and you kind of get very exasperated. And if I ask a lot of my back-end developer colleagues, they would tell me, you know, CSS is your problem, it's not mine. <laughs> uh, and they all really think CSS is pretty complicated. Anyway. That was 2003. What have we learned in 2003? Separation of content and style is a good thing. So it was around this, that point that we started writing semantic HTML, which was XHTML, and now we got HTML being purposed in different ways. We got SEO and all that, and HTML was really taking off in the semantic direction, which is great. But CSS is still pretty hard to write because there wasn't really much of an idea on how to solve this back then. Anyway, a few more years. And we realized that some, some people have thought like, hey, can we apply the same things that we know in programming in CSS? I mean, at the end of the day, they're both code, right? I mean, one's not programming, but still, it's code that we type out, and maybe we could think about ways to solve it these problems in a programming kind of way. So this is a pretty common thing. And we just kind of realized that, hey, uh, you have a button that also are other buttons. Isn't that like a programming concept? A programming concept in object-oriented programming, which is, you know, subclassing, wherein you could get one class and subclass it Okay, I just repeated myself, but the subclass is basically the same thing with a few changes, which is kind of what those buttons are, right? It's just the same thing with a few changes. Maybe we could apply the same paradigm. So object-oriented CSS was born around this time by someone, Nicole Sullivan, and uh, it was a very interesting concept. Uh, nowadays, you don't hear so much about it, which is a good thing, let me show you a while later. But one of the best things that came out of object-oriented CSS was to think in Legos. Um, that's actually not my term. She used the term Legos. Components are like Legos. The idea is, you know, CSS was getting bloated and people are writing more CSS than they should, so why not make little reusable snippets of components or Legos that you could reuse in multiple pages instead of having to rewrite them many, many times over. So the idea was to think of your pages in 
little Legos. And that was one of the great things out of object-oriented CSS, which is still alive today, which is really awesome. So, yeah, that was 2011. What have we learned so far, 2011? We've learned that separation of content and style is great. And we've learned that components are also great. So it turns out this, so this idea of writing in components has outlived OOCSS. It's, it's uh, been also around in many other you know, schools of thought. I'm gonna show you later. So the idea is OOCSS just kind of built on top of what we know about semantic HTML. And later on in the future, other things are gonna build upon the ideas of OOCSS and so on and so forth until what we will have today, which is great because this is us, you know, like a human society moving forward together. So turns out CSS is still hard to write. Anyway, that was 2011, a few more years, actually one year to be specific. We are still writing things in components, which is great. So it turns out that when you take a page, it's actually made up of components in that page. And that component is also made up of smaller components. And basically everything is just components all the way down. And this is kind of how we were starting to think because this is like one of the key takeaways of OOCSS. And we just kind of realized that, you know, this whole subclassing idea is still the same thing as components. I mean, they're just the same component. It turns out that it just happens to have a state, like, you know, a button has hover or focus or active. The same way it could have a danger, large, small, wide state. And this ideas were formulated into a book called SMACSS. Okay, I don't actually know how to pronounce this. They call it SMAX sometimes, but uh, it, it was really one of the great ideas that really took this idea of componentizing your CSS and writing a book about it, basically. So this was great. They called it modules in SMA CSS, where in this little pieces of UI widgets that could stand on their own are called modules, and these modules have states. And the other cool thing that came out of SMA CSS is that it started to have this idea that CSS should be written in layers. So CSS has the specificity, I always have trouble saying that word, wherein you could style a bear tag, a class name, an ID, and there's predefined rules of how one will override the other. Should take advantage of that, wherein you should write your code in layers. Like there's a base layer which tells us to style the base HTML tag, and there's a layout layer that tells us how to uh, position components relative to one another. And we have the actual modules, which are the actual styles, you know, the background colors and all, and we have the states, which are overrides for the modules. So basically, states override modules, override layers, override the base. So this layered approach was one of the key ideas of SMA CSS which was pretty cool. And nowadays, we still use SMA CSS and still refer to it, but the uh, idea has evolved. But in 2012, what have we learned? Uh, separation of content and style is still a really good idea. So everything we have so far is still about the same idea of making things more manageable and separating concerns. HTML is about your document. CSS is about how it looks, and it has to stay that way. It tells us to create a component library, just like OOCSS, and tells it that everything is actually a component all the way down. So everything's just components inside components. And this idea has survived through many years, apparently 2012, but CSS is still kind of very tough to write at least for some people. Anyone here thinks CSS is hard to write? Yeah. 
Okay, I'm glad that some of you didn't raise your hands. So, cool. So, another year, coming year, okay. So, we had OOCSS, we had SMACs or SMACSS telling us that components are great. So, what if we took those ideas and turned them into con conventions of how to name your class names? So, one of these ideas were to name your class names based on what components and what elements are in those components. So basically like this, we're in, you have a block, underscore, underscore, an element, underscore, a modifier. So this is called block element modifier. So this was one of the ideas that really formalized one of the hallmarks of OOCSS and SMA CSS, which is everything is a component but how do we write CSS for it? So BEM is like, this is how you write CSS for it. This is how you should make your CSS. You should write really long convoluted class names, which is great because again, everything is really a component and all those names just basically lend well to be um, class names. And this was also around a time that SAS has been in development and we had this ampersand, uh, I guess you could call it an operator. So you could write CSS very elegantly in BEM, which is really fantastic. So that, that ampersand becomes whatever the parent is. So basically they just concatenate the two together like that. Like that, like that, like that, like that. So CSS was very fun to write in BEM. And a lot of people are happy with BEM. A lot of the sites we have today in production that you're going to visit on every day of your lives is actually written in BEM, which is great. Um, except it leads to some really strange markup, which some people are not very happy with. But uh, it's one of the drawbacks of BEM. But it makes your CSS very nice to write. So that was 2003, 13, 2013. What have we learned? So the same thing. Content and style separation is still a good thing. I mean, that idea has been there since 2003. We're still doing it in 2016. So there must be something to it. So that is good. Create a component library. So BEM is still about componentizing or blocks, thinking in blocks. So that idea has per persevered through OOCSS, MaxCSS, and BEM. So there must be something to it, you know, creating a component library where everything is a component. And we just kind of realized that CSS conventions are extremely useful. Finally, making that last, you know, uh, writing CSS is hard it's now much easier. However, some people don't like it, so let's move on, see how else we have evolved. That was 2013, move on, one more year, 2014, okay, two years ago. Um, we, as a human society, have moved on from uh, really slow backends and realized that, hey, maybe we should put things on the front end and make really fancy web apps and, you know, make the browser do more things than it should. So, React.js. Yes. Uh, there's actually a lot of JS frameworks that came around this era. React is one of the bigger ones that everyone's talking about. It seems like everyone I know is talking about React. And React tells us to think in React components, which you could nest. So that same thing could be implemented in React using nested components. So, that's all very familiar, right? That's basically how we've been thinking about CSS in, the, in BEM and SMA CSS and OOCSS. Everything is a component, and everything is a component in a component, and so on and so forth. Nested components, right? But it's not just React who has this idea. Uh, if you were going to do it in Vue.js, also one of the most popular JavaScript frameworks, you would do it pretty much the same. If you were gonna do it in Ember, it's still gonna be the same thing. Everything's an Ember component. So all of these JS frameworks coming out today, as in 
almost everyone, just pick one, even Angular, Ember, all of them, they all work in this componentized you know, methodology. So there really must be something to it because we have been building JavaScript in components just as we have been doing CSS. And that's great because now once you have ideas that have been in, you know, lingering around for a decade, it means there must be something to it, right? So 2014, we've learned that separation of content and style is great. Everything is still a component and component libraries are great and conventions are still useful. But, you know, I didn't really talk about CSS, so uh, CSS is still pretty hard for some people. 2015. Okay, uh, a few more ideas came. Just, just like one idea coming out every year. Actually, just like so many ideas coming out every year. Excuse me if I'm just focusing on one idea per year, but 2015, turns out that we are still building things in little components like, you know, this is one CSS component you might build, like a star rating, which is actually part of another component, and that component is part of another component, and that component is part of another component, and that component is part of a page. So that's basically what we have been learning through like a decade of progress. And this is kind of like uh, atoms were in, you have atoms which are part of molecules, which are part of materials, and so on and so forth. So this idea was formalized in a book called Atomic Design. So Brad Frost, Frost wrote an entire book about that idea that I have been talking about for 10 minutes. He wrote an entire book about it, basically telling us that everything is a component and everything is supposed to be written in smaller components, which are put in other bigger components. So that's how we achieve sanity with our CSS. It's how we achieve faster code loading times. It's how we achieve, well, basically how to manage these monstrous 1.6 megabyte CSS that we have today. So there must be something with that idea, right? Because it seems like all of these ideas are one idea and then the next one just builds on top of what was good of the previous one. Maybe discard some of the bad. And that's basically how things evolve, right? And that's how everything has evolved in technology. We have JS frameworks and we have new JS frameworks coming out, which are basically the same ideas. and. They just take what actually works and discard whatever doesn't and move on and for the next iteration, do the same. And if JS Frameworks has come a long way and we have this idea of components that are in just about every JS Framework and we have the idea of components in just about every CSS, I don't know if you would call it framework, but a CSS idea, so there really must be something there because it just persists in everything and seems like everything is a component. So that is great because that means we have now settled into a standard of how we write our JS, how we write our CSS. And no matter what you do, if you choose BEM or any other uh, standard out there, it's still building on top of this idea that everything is a component which is great. So what I'm telling you is you have to think of everything as components. And what we have learned so far, we actually haven't quite addressed the last point yet because for some people, BEM is still kind of rough and it leads to this mess of a markup in HTML that people don't really like. So moving on, 2015, again, uh, there's this little book slash document called RSCSS. Uh, it's in rscss.io. It's a reasonable system for CSS style sheet structure. And it basically builds upon all those decades of ideas and tries to improve upon them. And everything is still made with components, just like 
every other idea in the past, wherein you have little pieces of UI, which are components, part of other bigger pieces of UI, which are also components. So components all the way down. So what, it's kind of like BEM or CSS, but it's a little easier to write. So if you remember this component, you would probably do this semantically in HTML like this. Uh, those are class names, basically nothing fancy, nothing like photo card underscore underscore this and that. So it's just what it is. So we're back to semantic HTML ideas. The only difference is, uh, well, in CSS, you would write it in the same structure. So if you notice the HTML structure closely mirrors what you would expect in CSS. That's the HTML and that's the CSS. It's basically the same thing. And the magic there is the operator called like this. It's a child, direct child descendant selector, which seems like a bad idea at first, but I'll tell you, it's a really good one. Let me just explain myself. So the rule so far as CSS is very simple. So one is components are always in two words. So they are separated by a hyphen, so like photo card, search box, always two or more words, and elements are just one word, so that's a uh, details, heading, title, subtitle, action, button, and the variants begin with a hyphen, so dash small, dash large, and of course use that. So in practice it looks kind of like this, and it just makes things much easier if you have this convention because now so every, we have like class names in CSS and we don't really know what the class names are. I mean, is this a component? Is this a block? Is this an element? And if you have a convention like this, you automatically know if it's dash small, oh, that's a variant. Or if it's one word, oh, that's an element. So that brings a lot of sanity into how you're going to organize your CSS. Yeah, so that's RSCSS. In practice, it probably looks like this. So if you have a button, probably name it like a button box because it needs to be two words. And probably give it a variant for the small one, which is part of a bigger component, maybe call this a callout box. And that component has elements inside it. And you could also nest components inside components. If you notice button box, is a component inside a component, which is good because now at a glance, looking at the markup, we know button box is a component and everything else there is an element without having to really think about it because, you know, two words, component, one word, element. Perfect. Okay. So uh, in, the, in, the, in the CSS, it looks pretty much the same as your HTML. And the magic there's another magical thing that's gonna happen. So if you save that as one component per CSS file, so if you save this as callout box.scss, and every component is just, every component file is just really talking about one component, then they don't care about each other. They're self-contained pieces of CSS code, and I could just import them all together uh, without really caring about how they're ordered. So it's one of the magics of it. No more like importing every CSS file and figuring out how to load them properly. So one component per CSS file. It makes things a lot easier. So in practice, so for example, if you have a page like this, that is a component which has smaller components, that, that, and that. And that is also another component that is also another component. And this is now a component with an element of a tab. And the tab element could have a modifier active, which is dash active. Uh, also another component. And this one, I haven't really discussed this. Just check out the website, but it's called a layout. So it doesn't really tell you how to style it. It just really lays out. It tells you that left should be left, right should be right. And that's a that's how you would make it as a layout component, which has more components inside it. That is also a layout, which uh, that button group has buttons inside it. So everything is a component, and that's rscss.io. And 
out of all of these ideas that I've discussed today, starting with RSCSS and going back to semantic HTML, the one idea that really persisted with everything is that everything is a component. Yeah, we're just basically building little Legos that put together more bigger Legos, which eventually become pages. And it's been around for, this idea has been around for decades, so there must be something to it. And just to show you where we're going, I, there are a couple of proposals to HTML and CSS that are also moving in that direction. We have uh, web components, which you might know as Polymer, at least in some form. Basically, self-contained elements could be placed in external HTMLs, complete with style and behavior in one encapsulated file that you could embed into other files. And uh, there's also a CSS at scope proposal. And you can't use this yet. I don't think it's implemented, but it's in the works. Basically, it's letting you scope CSS into a certain something, like a class name or any selector. And you're assured that it's not going to bleed into other scopes. So your styles and user profile is not going to bleed into its deeper components. So. If I could just tell you one thing today, it's our always thinking components. And that's me, Rico, also known as Arsta Cruz. And thank you so much. Oh, well, anyone have any questions? Suggestions, comments, and uh, anything mm. else? So, hello? Hello? Uh, here, in the back. Hi! Hello! <laughs> so, Hi. Uh, I personally, I use BEM in production. Hmm? Uh, I use BEM in production. Okay. Uh, but one of the problem that I have with it is, uh, say I have a parent component and a child component. So where should the glue be? So the uh, glue between this uh, reusable small component and the parent component. So where should I write that? So you're having trouble nesting the components. Because so say a header is there. Hmm? Say a header is there. Header component. Header. Uh, header of a page. Hello? Hi, yeah. So, say there is a header of a page. Header component. So, and uh, I have a search bar inside it. Both are components, reusable. But where should I write the CSS that binds both of them? Which It should be in the search bar component or the header component? Oh, so you basically have two components that sort of Nest. belong together, but you don't know what should... Where should I write the glue between them? Between in Oh, the glue between them. Yeah. So, like, say, for example, like a Facebook like button and a like count, like that. Yeah. Uh, you want to glue them together in JS or... No, no, no. So in, in say CSS. I have a search bar. Right, so... It is nested inside a header component. Okay. So, so, like, say, for example, the parent-child relationship okay. CSS. Where should it rely? Where should it reside? Which should it uh, should that CSS be in the file of search bar, or should it be inside the file of uh, header? Sorry, I'm, I'm having a little trouble understanding. But say, for example, you have I think you have two components which kind of belong together, and you want to glue them together, uh, but you don't know where maybe CSS I'll would. Maybe code later offline. Where CSS would belong. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, so, so anyway, let me try anyway. So, so how I understand it is say you have a Facebook like button and a number of likes. So those are two components, but they belong together. But now, where do you write their code? So in our CSS, that would be like this is one component, the like is one component, like like button and like count, so their styles would belong in like button.css and like count.css. And that 
like container is another component, most likely just a layout which will have like uh, which would have its own CSS file. Sorry, I, I hope that that answers the question. Hi, Rico. Hey, Hi. how are you? Where are you, man? Here. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Hi. What can I do for you? Great talk. Uh, I have one question. Uh, so usually in our daily lives, a lot of people write CSS, right? Uh, but uh, reviewers always go with the thing that okay, if if the page, <laughs> page looks proper with the what content has been given with what designers are done, okay, it looks good, we can carry on with the production. But, ah, right. but there is no tool to assess the quality of CSS code being written. So what can you, what okay. can we do about that? Okay, I have a couple of suggestions. I, I'm going to guess you're like a, a shop that builds many projects for different people, right? And you have designers and developers on staff. Am I correct? Yeah. All right, so we also have that set up uh, in our company, and each project has one designer slash front end developer, the same guy. So the problem is he would send out a pull request or, you know, please review this, but then again, no one could actually review it because he's the only one who knows about CSS in that project. So one of the ways we do that is even if one project has one designer, we have another guy come in as a, like, a mentor to that person and essentially that per other person is going to review their code. So that's one way around it. Uh, number two is there are actually tools that let you review CSS code. Uh, there's, say, for example, SCSS Lint, which tries to enforce certain conventions into how you write your your, you know, your CSS, at least your SAS CSS. Uh, so there is that. And yeah, so yeah, there are ways around it. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, here you go. Nice hey. Uh, I had a question regarding our RS CSS. Uh, so is there any uh, backwards incompatibility or anything to do with this? I mean, it's more of a convention, right? Rather than something new mm -hmm. that you're trying, except scope, I guess. Scope being something that's only supported in the more modern browsers. Oh yeah, yeah. well, at scope is not part of our CSS or BEM or anything else because it's yeah, as you said, it's just a proposal that hasn't been implemented yet. What about the rest of the project? Is that something that's supported by even the slightly? Oh, uh, which one? Like r the rest of our CSS. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, the child descendant selector. The only browser you will have problem with that's probably IE6. So, probably yeah. <laughs> not a problem. Yeah. But uh, my, like, I guess the selector has always been a questionable thing in terms of performance, right? Ah, performance. Okay. Right. So, here's the thing: writing two classes together versus writing a class, child descendant class. Usually, the the one with the child descendant is actually faster. Uh, because it doesn't have to traverse all, the CSS engine doesn't have to traverse all the way back just to find if this is an ancestor of this. It just doesn't have to search that far. So it's actually uh, a pretty good performance choice. However, it does concede that in BEM, since it's just using one class name, that's actually faster. But in practice, I've seen sites built in RSSS and similar that are really big, like, you know, one MBCSS big, and it's still, it's still manageable. It's not something that is really that big of a problem nowadays, especially with better hardware. But yeah, it, in short, it's never been a problem in performance. Yeah, sure. The Q&A time, please take your questions also. Okay, if anyone else has any yeah. questions, I'll be around. Yeah, please take all your other questions.